Are you working with a bad boss who's incapable of guidance, making you feel stuck or stifled in your career development? You might be lost on how to be a good team member, how to get work done, or even just navigating organizational politics. In this video, I'm going to talk about some strategies to help you become more self-sufficient as an individual in your organization, even if your boss is incapable. Unfortunately, bad bosses are all over the place. In fact, in a recent survey that I did on my channel, I found that 45% of people said that they have never had a good boss. And that to me is mind blowing. And because 45% of you said that you've never had a good boss, I want to paint a picture for you really quickly of what does it look like to have a good boss? Now I want to take, for example, two different employees. Let's say on one hand we have John and on the other hand we have Sarah. John and Sarah were hired by the same company as junior employees. John had a good boss who provided direction, asked for regular updates on projects, and gave helpful feedback when necessary. This allowed John to quickly become proficient in the job and eventually move up to a higher position within the organization. Now, on the other hand, Sarah, who started at the same time as John, had a terrible boss who was rarely around, always set unrealistic deadlines, and never gave any guidance. As a result, Sarah often felt confused and helpless when it came to managing her work. She found it difficult to make progress and felt stuck in her position for months. Eventually, John, who had a good boss, got promoted relatively quickly for exceeding in his job. On the other hand, Sarah felt really burned out and ready to quit. Now, I'm not saying that having a good boss versus a bad boss is ultimately the deciding factor in what's gonna make you successful in your career, but it really does give you a boost or almost like a power up um, for how you can succeed in your role, especially in the early years. Fortunately, if you've never had a good boss, it's not impossible and it's not too late to get a jump start and get ahead in your career in ways that you never have before. So in order to structure this conversation, I wanna lay out what are the criteria or what are the things that a good boss would cover that you would have to do for yourself. So if you are in a position where you're feeling like Sarah and you're saying, I don't really know what my direction is, I'm feeling burnt out, I'm getting unrealistic expectations from my boss, and I just don't really know what to do, let's lay out what is the criteria for what a good boss should do and what are the things that you are able to do within that to support yourself. I have six different criteria for what a good boss should do or what a good boss does do that if you've never had one, just to give you an insight into what they should be doing on a regular basis. The first thing is aligning with executives. Now this is really important, especially when it comes to organizational politics because your supervisor is supposed to act as the middle person, the middle man, the middle woman, the middle person between what the executives are saying and what your actual role is supposed to entail. So that's one of the criteria is they are supposed to align with executives. The second thing that they're supposed to do is identify resource gaps. Now, as a manager or let's say a director, whatever that level is, they are given a certain level of resource allocations, whether it be money or budgets or people or time, when it comes to getting projects done, they know what those allocations are. And if they see that, let's say one employee versus another is having issues getting a project done because of lack of resources, it's up to the supervisor or the manager or the director to make sure that those resource gaps are filled or accounted for when they're working through projects and when they're working through timelines. The third criteria for a good boss is protecting you from politics, especially if you are an entry level, let's just say mid-level employee. A lot of politics happens at the executive level and if you have a manager that's between you and let's say an executive, a C-suite, their primary role is to make sure that you have direction without getting caught up in the organizational politics because it's really difficult for people who are actually doing the work to do the work, but also have to manage a bunch of egos. So that's what a manager is supposed to be doing in order to move projects forward. The fourth criteria of a good manager is they're supposed to set priorities on the pipeline. So whatever function that you operate in, let's say you are in HR, you're in marketing, you're in sales, you're in operations, you're in IT, whatever that looks like, your supervisor is responsible for making sure that they set priorities for what you're supposed to accomplish and when. If you don't have an idea of when projects are supposed to get done or really what's even the main priority when it comes to work, that's because that's your supervisor's job. And a good supervisor is able to articulate that to their team and pivot when they need to. The fifth thing is that they are able to allocate resources. 
Now, similar to the resource conversation, a good supervisor not only identifies the gaps, but they're also able to allocate what are the resources that need to work on a super project and what is the budget required for that specific project to be completed. And the last thing of a really good supervisor, the last criteria of a really good supervisor is they're able to articulate efficient workflows. Now, if you have never worked with a good boss, all of these things that I have laid out, all of the criteria that I have laid out is not really gonna make a ton of sense to you, mostly because if you don't have a supervisor that has demonstrated that to you, it's gonna be really hard to be able to articulate, oh, these are the things that I need to look for in a good boss, or these are the things that a boss should be doing. Now, the fact that we've covered these you should at least be a little bit aware in your own role if you can look and see and say, oh, you know, actually my supervisor never did allocate budget correctly or we do have a lot of ineffective workflows. That should get your brain going and saying, okay, what are the gaps that I have seen in my own role or in my own function or organization that I can take advantage of to excel my career, to move my career forward, and frankly, just to be able to do your job in a better way. Okay, so now that we've gone through the criteria of what is a good boss and you've kind of gotten thinking, what are the things that I should be looking to do in my own business or my own career? Now let's jump to how do you actually become self-sufficient? What are the things that you can do to be self-sufficient in your organization if your boss is just really not good? I have four big, let's call them action items, um, that you can actually do today to start becoming more self-sufficient in your organization and start accounting for or start covering yourself the criteria that your supervisor should be covering. The first thing that you wanna do is you wanna create your lane. This means setting up goals and objectives for yourself as well as an action plan that aligns with what you wanna accomplish. Now, I know it does a lot of big fluffy words that might not mean anything. Basically, you wanna just know what is your lens in which you are gonna operate. If you are, let's say, a marketing person and you need to be doing a certain type of project, let's say you're running a series of social media posts, your lens or your objective would be to figure out how to create the most engaging content for your audience. Or if you are in HR and you're working on training, if you, let's say as an example, if you're running a training organization or you're running a training, your lens might be, I wanna figure out how to create the most interesting or most engaging um, training material that helps get my lesson across in the shortest amount of time possible. Whatever that lens or whatever that lane looks like for you, you can create goals and objectives around that. Once you've had that lane, you can say, how do I actually build out my step-by-step-by-step -step -step process for how to get to the goal that I've set out for myself? The second thing that you wanna do to build a more self-sufficient workflow is to start networking with decision makers. Now, the easiest way to do that is to look at who are the ultimate people that run your organization. And sometimes it's not always executives, but Usually if you kind of look, okay, my CEO, you know, the executive level, maybe the vice president level, who are the people in the organization who are making decisions or who are driving the ship? And it's not usually your supervisor, almost in every case, it's never your supervisor. But if you can look who is running the show and just start networking with those people, having, taking them out for coffee, asking their advice on different workflow things that you're doing. If you've never met them before and you notice that they're very busy, you can just say, hey, I would love to learn more about your type of work, or I, you know, I really am aspiring to become like you when I'm older. Those type of comments go really far, especially with executive level. So it's not very difficult to get to start networking with people, but you do have to be the first one to reach out. Um, but you wanna make sure that if your boss is especially absent in those conversations, that you wanna make sure that you are building relationships with the key decision makers in your organization. The third thing that you wanna do is you wanna leverage technology and automation. Different artificial intelligences, different technologies that you're able to utilize in whatever role that you're in. Um, if you look, one of the things that a good supervisor is able to do is articulate what are the gaps that we have in our workflow, what are the gaps that we have in our processes, and you working every single day, you know exactly where your gaps are and you know exactly what needs to be done to fill those workflows or to make those workflows more efficient. So one thing that you're able to do if you have an absentee boss is to figure out what technologies, what innovations, what things can you incorporate into your workflow to make them more automated, to make them more sophisticated, and to kind of have them run on their own. If you're able to do that, it helps you cover a lot of the small stuff that you would have otherwise had to focus on and start focusing on bigger picture projects or bigger picture kind of tasks 
that you need to be thinking about in order to advance your career. And the last thing, the fourth thing that you wanna to do to become more self-sufficient if you have a bad boss is that you wanna be able to sculpt your role. Now, what does that actually mean? If you were to go through your job description currently line by line, I bet you would say there are maybe half of the things on your job description when you were hired that you're not actually doing right now. And I would almost bet money also that if you looked at your job description right now, the things that are on your to-do list or the things that are on your list are things that your supervisor isn't even aware that you're supposed to be doing. So if you can look at what you're currently doing in your role, maybe you revisit your job description and you say, okay, these are the, let's say you have 30 things on your job description, you pick out five or 10 things that are really exciting to you that you find most fulfilling, and you figure out how to chip away all the pieces of your job that you don't like and focus only on the things that you do like. Now, I know that that sounds like cheating or that sounds like you're not doing your job, and I promise you no one will know the difference <laughs> if you are able to uh, slowly start getting rid of or delegating or closing out the things that you don't like doing and start investing more time building out the things you do like doing, you're gonna notice that more of those types of projects, the things, let's say you invest more time in the stuff that you're loving, you're gonna notice that people are gonna start giving you more of those projects because you've been doing a really good job with those. So if you're able to sculpt your role, that's gonna be a really, really huge thing that you're able to do. And if you're looking for how to improve your relationship with your boss, let's say you have a micromanaging boss, check out this video about how to deal with a micromanager. And with that, I'll see you on the next one.